Okay, so the three financial statements are cash flow, profit, loss, and net worth. We're going to focus most, mostly on the profit and loss. The cash flow is a very simple one to understand. It's just cash in and cash out. And it's just if you wrote the check, it's on there that month. If you receive the income, it's on there. It says nothing about the profit of a dairy. A cash flow says nothing about the profit of the dairy. All it says is, can I pay my bills? And so if you have expenses that are seasonal, like putting in a crop or harvesting a crop, you may have cash flow shortages at a time where you may need some operating money from the bank to get you through that short-term cash flow. But don't at all let that confuse you about profit on your dairy. They're not one and the same. So it is an important statement, but it says nothing about profit. So a profit loss statement has uh, no principal on it. As we said, that's an investment that doesn't belong in a P&L. It's not a cost <laughs> to the dairy. We have depreciation and interest doing both uh, doing the depreciation correctly as we talked about and accounting for all our interest and it needs to be accrual at least on feed and milk at least on feed and milk doesn't have to be accrual on everything at least on feed and milk uh, net worth is just a balance sheet that's a snapshot kind of the value of our business valuing cows valuing facilities the only thing I'd encourage you to do on your own uh, balance sheet or net worth statement is to be conservative when you val value assets um, we've had several instances, very well known in my country, where a bank, a bank came into a group of dairies. This was back in 07 or 08 before we had our big meltdown in 09. Bank came into these dairies and they had about $1,400, $1,500 per cow on their balance sheet. And they, and they determined their equity based on that. So this other bank came in and said, you know, the dairy industry is really good which it was at that time, we think cows are worth $1,900, $1,900. So we're going to loan you based on $1,900 cows. What did that do to the equity position of a 3,000 cow dairy? Suddenly they got millions of dollars worth of equity in cows that was funny money. It wasn't real. It was just made up money that really wasn't there. So what did these guys do with that extra equity? What did American dairymen do? Milk more cows, right? They build other dairies. Well, then the crash came in 09, and the bank auditors came in, not the ones that gave the loan, the auditors above them, and said, gee, cows aren't worth $1,900. Who the heck came up with this? Cows are really worth $1,400. Guess what? All those dairies, immediately loans were called in, and the dairies were done. And so we can't be in a position of overvaluing assets, of going way high or way low. I know when I do net worth statements and for our businesses going forward, we're going to be conservative on cows, conservative on feed, and put in reasonable numbers that are going to last over the long term and not jump in these things year in and year out. Also, when you go to calculating returns for your dairy, we'll do return on equity here in a minute. Um, if you overinflate or underinflate your equity position, you can really make your returns look a lot different than what, what you think they are. Okay? All right, so what is a P&L then? It's a look at operations. It describes operational efficiency of a dairy. So uh, I go to dairies all the time that tell, give me a wealth of data about their dairy. We've got Dairy Comp or PC Dart or DHI Plus. They're software programs we have that analyze reproductive efficiency, how well cows are milking, breeding, uh, health events, everything in the world. We've got all kinds of this other data we look at. We've got milk meters, we've got activity meters, we've got rumen meters, we've got all this data, all this data, but most of those dairies can't give me a P&L. It's the most important thing for a dairy to look at. I don't care about all this other stuff if I don't know if the dairy is making money, if I don't know if the dairy is financially efficient. That's more important than anything else you can collect, but I would venture a guess that nine out of 10 dairies in the US cannot hand me a P&L if I went to the dairy and asked for it. In fact, they probably couldn't even give me the information so I could construct one myself. So if you don't have a P&L for your dairy, you need to have one for your dairy. And this workshop today is not gonna teach you how to go home and be an accountant, but maybe it'll at least uh, uh, make you say, hey, I need to find somebody that can help me put this together. Maybe a local accountant, maybe a local lender, somebody to help you to put together a P&L so you have this for your dairy going forward. It's the most important thing for dairy. Just think about if you went to any other manufacturing business that manufactured a commodity and asked them, what does it cost to make their product? And they scratch their heads and said, you know, we never figured that out. We have no idea. We just make it and we hope we make money and hope things turn out, but we never bother to figure out what our costs are. Most dairies in my country are that way. I don't know if it's that way here or not, but it is in my country. So the purpose is to look at the dairy and not confuse with other businesses, uh, heifers and farming. And you want, we want to make sure that dairy can survive as a standalone business. We want to make sure it can survive as a standalone business. So let's look about this debt proposition. All right, we, we, uh, it's been very intriguing for me to see the view of your lenders here on equity. Uh, it seems the few that I've talked to, and granted, this is only a few in the last week and a half, 
is that your lenders tend to like more equity in your businesses than lenders in my country do. They require a little bit more equity, or so it seems. Uh, so let's look at the implications of equity within your business uh, and see where you sit on the scale. There's no right or wrongs in this. All right, let's use for easy round numbers. Uh, I wanted to make it easy so Michael didn't have to get out a calculator here, okay? So no calculator, easy round numbers. We'll all divide by 10 million. So let's start out with $10 million in assets and let's say our P&L net income was a million dollars, all right? At the end of the month or at the end of the, the year, we were able to generate a million dollars in P&L net income. So let's say an example one, we got $5 million in equity. What's our equity percent? Michael? 50%, right? 50%, all right, easy math. So $5 million is what we own. The total business is worth 10 million, so we got a 50% equity position. You may say that's high, you might say low, you might be happy with that, you might not, but that's where the business is. So what is the return on equity? 20%, right? Somebody said it, 20%. So we got a million dollars divided by five million, so we got 20% return on equity. So let's say we have a few good years, like we are now experiencing in the U.S. dairy industry. This is the best period we've ever had in the history of the industry. We're just doing great. We're very happy. So we pay off debt and pay off debt, and we own more of the dairy. Now we got an 80% equity. What have we changed on the dairy? Have we changed at all this P&L net income potential? Have we changed the P&L in the dairy at all? No, we have not. We may have changed interest just a little bit, not much to amount to much of anything. That ability of that business operationally to generate a profit has not changed by the fact that we own more of it. We've changed the risk equation greatly. We've changed the risk equation greatly, but we haven't changed the ability to make money in the business. So what's now a return on investment? 12%, all right? It slides down. There's no right or wrong in this. I'm not telling you you should be a low equity dairy. I'm not telling you you should not be a high equity. This is a very personal choice for a business owner to make. You need to understand the implications of it. So where I get to see troubles in my country is when we have partners on a dairy and one partner is literally feeding their family from the business. This is their only source of income. Their family works there. They're there full time. They've got no other businesses. What is that person, where is that person likely to sit on this equation? Well, they're going to want a lot of equity because they want to be sure that dairy survives another year. They're willing to accept lower returns to take risk off the table to be sure that that dairy survives. The investor that maybe has another business like maybe a ranch or maybe a farm or some other business where they're not really getting cash out of that dairy every month, it's just an investment for them. They're not looking at it to support their family. They want to be up here. They want to be as low as equity as they can. So just think if you took this down and you were a 30% equity dairy, your returns would keep climbing and climbing and climbing. But it gets very, very sketchy when you get that low in equity. The risk is quite big. So there's a number of dairies in the U.S. have taken this and have stated publicly to say that, hey, we never want more than 45% equity in any one of our dairies. As soon as we get more than 45%, we're building the next one. Why do we want to own this thing? Let the bank own it. We're going to keep the profits and generate a great return. Just think about this, this $8 million in equity right there. If you were to split that and take $4 million at 80% and have two dairies at 40%, you'd milk twice as many cows with the same equity twice as many P&L net income, okay? So that's really a big uh, um, uh, motivator or driver of growth in the U.S. dairy industry. Without that principle, without lenders that would allow dairies to come in at low equity that are good operators, it's hard for a dairy to grow. That's how we get 30,000 cow dairies and 20,000 cow dairies, is dairies get very aggressive and really grow. So again, I'm not telling you where you should be, but realize the implications of it and, uh, and follow your returns.